Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. There has not been a bloodless revolution. I have not kicked Alina and Alex out, but I have somehow found myself in the chair today. And with me is the wonderful Nina. Who have we got on today? Well, today we have got Professor Ewan Rees Morris. Um, and our our project today is to ask him how to speak to us about his new and fascinating book um, about how the Victorians got us to the moon. And I, for one, am delighted uh, to, to tackle this. I think it's a fascinating subject. And uh, Professor, I think you've taken a, a, a really interesting and um, comprehensive look at the subject of Victorians, technology, big changes in culture, and how this uh, has positioned us to, to move into the 20th and the 21st century. Could you give us a, a, a quick summary of, uh, of the, the project and perhaps how you became interested in it? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a historian of Victorian science generally. Um, so I've been interested in the relationship between Victorian science and Victorian culture um, for a very long time, for pretty much most of my professional career as a historian. Um, and a few years ago, I was working on a project that was particularly looking at the ways in which people in the past thought about the future. So the history of the future, if you like. And obviously, my part of the, part of the project, given that I am a historian of Victorian science, was looking at Victorian futures. Um, and one of the things that struck me in particular, looking at how ideas about the future developed during the 19th century, was the extent to which, if you like, I mean, in lots of ways, I, mean, I think this is one of the key messages that I want to get across in the book, that the Victorians invent the future. In anything like the sense that we now, we now ourselves think about the future. Um, if you go back much earlier than the Victorian period, um, say you go back to the middle of the 18th century, um, ask somebody, OK, what's, what are things going to be like in 100 years? Then the likely answer is going to be that, well, things will be much the same, possibly another king on the throne. But other than that, we'll be in the same kind of world. If you hop forward to, say, 1850, well, actually make it 1851, if you stop one of the people going into the... Crystal Palace, the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851, and ask them, you know, what do you think it's going to be like in 100 years? Then you're going to get a very, very different answer. The future is going to be different. It's not going to be like the present. And for the Victorians, by and large, it's going to be made out of, it's going to be made out of electricity and flying machines. <laughs> in lots of ways, that's the kind of stereotypical Victorian view of the future. And I think in, in all sorts of ways, yeah, that kind of invention of a new sort of future, you know, the kind of future that we think of now. You know, when we think about the future, we think of the future as a different country. The, the Victorians invented that way of thinking and <laughs> in many ways reorient or if I even reinvent science and technology during the 19th century as a way of getting us to that future, as a way of getting themselves into that future so that science and technology become tools of future making in all sorts of interesting ways. And that's what the book tries to cover and unpack. Remarkable and, and, and amazing um, thinking. Um, I know that um, one of the, one of the points that you, you make in your book is that we forget what a remarkable break with the past this is because we have that perspective now. We absorbed it from the Victorians and we've gone forward with it. And so most of us don't question this perspective about the future, the way we think about the future, the way we plan for the future. So I'm fascinated by this um, remarkable break. And I know that, um, you know, of course, the Victorians are known for their technological innovation, which, of course, is supported by 
the Industrial Revolution and so on and so forth. But what other factors um, come into it in your mind? Uh, what are the most important things, uh, whether it's thinking, whether it's um, a change in the way that one views religion? Um, what how, can you tell our listeners what the, the major factors are that, that uh, come together in this ferment and this uh, astonishing change? I think that this notion of the future is different. You know, that thought has a great deal to do with this kind of flurry of technological innovation that takes place. I mean, really, I mean, throughout the 19th century. Um, I mean, it's tied up in some ways with, you know, with, you know, with the idea of progress. You know, so 18th century, the world is, you know, everything is in equilibrium, everything's static. The 19th century has this notion of progress. You know, nature progresses, society progresses. And technology seen as one of seen as one of the one of the drivers of change. So there's you know, so, so there's that desire for technological innovation that didn't didn't exist to such a degree before the 19th century. Um, there is also inevitably, and I think this is another important strand in the story. Um, there's a matter of empire here. Um, Britain in particular during the 19th century has, as a result of kind of imperial adventure, has access to unparalleled resources. You can do things that you couldn't do before because you literally have the resources of empire at your, at your disposal. Um, and of course, money. You know, money flows in from the empire as well. And you know, all sorts of from all kinds of sources. So the Victorian age is, a, is an age in which money can be made out of technology. Technology becomes a way of making and remaking the future. And it's entirely bound up with the business of empire. One of the ways in which you know, what, it is, you know, what it is the science is for, that's kind of reimagined during this period, is you know, science as an arm of imperialism, science as a way of facilitating imperialism. Yeah. And you know, when you look at the kind of huge gargantuan you know, engineering projects that are you know, that take place during during, during the nineteenth century, they're, you know, they're, 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 you know, there there's an implicit imperial intent in a lot of them. Um, you know, there's something like some Thomas Telford you know, building that you know the huge Pont Cassastain aqueduct across the across the Vale of Dee, you know, describing it in you know, explicitly you know, imperial terms. It's, it's almost as if almost I think they are invoking you know, right, right. You know, the picture of imperial Rome and kind of projected in projecting it into Britain's own future. You have business for having problems that it then needs engineers and scientists to come up to solu- come up with solutions to like the uh the across atlantic telegraph uh wires um yes i mean i think that i mean that, that's that's absolutely right i mean that you get into a position where sort of one thing is building on the other um and i think the i mean the atlantic cable i think is a is a is a really nice example of that because i mean it brings together a lot of the ingredients, if you like, of the Victorian future. Um, people are there to make money. Um, you know, people are investing hugely in the Atlantic cable because the cable, they hope, is in all sorts of ways going to make their make, make their fortune. Um, the Atlantic cable was projected as, and indeed it was, a kind of way of transforming transatlantic commerce and communication in in all sorts of ways I mean, suddenly, you know, suddenly you can find out in liverpool or in london very very quickly you know what the price of wheat shall we say in chicago and new york might be you know that has a huge impact on the way that you know, in, in the way the trade and the way that finance works from the middle of the 19th century onwards and that kind of fuels innovation other hopeful inventors, other hopeful inventor entrepreneurs see the success of projects like that and think, I want that too. So you get that kind of surge of innovation. And of course, as well, 
the telegraph networks that kind of started off with the Atlantic Cable by the end of the 19th century are a hugely important aspect of imperial governance. Um, by the end of the 19th century, one of the key aims of, uh, of the empire is to establish and maintain what they call the all red route. Um, and that's literally a network of telegraph cables and uh, 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 that never crosses into or over potentially hostile territory. Right? You don't want to be dependent on your telegraph communications crossing, say, the Ottoman Empire or the Russian Empire right. or right. indeed the United States. Yeah. Britain wants to be in command of the telegraph network, right. so they make sure that they do. You know, that there are that there are underwater cables connecting all the various outposts of empire, right. so that they're under secure British control. Because to an increasing degree, you know, that's what the telegraph is for. The telegraph is for controlling and governing and administering the empire. As a naval historian of the, like the early 20th century, uh, working on battleship designs through the 1880s, you get a lot of invention and engineers coming in to work on there. Other than business, the, the other main driving force is always the military. How, how much does the Victorian military machine also affect um, science and technology within the um, Victorian era? Um I mean, the naval connections of science stretch back you know, so well before the, the the 19th century, um, and particularly in terms of, you know, sort of astronomy and navigation. You know, being able to figure out where you are at sea is quite important if you if you're a wannabe naval naval power. So you know, astronomy is a useful tool for that purpose. I mean, one of the things going on with the kind of hideous battles for control of the Royal Society during the 1820s, 1830s is because the reformers want you know, want to get their hands on the money that the Admiralty is paying for things like the sort of the Board of Longitude and the Nautical Almanac and so on. Um, and more than that, I mean, when you have, you know, for example, during the during the 1830s and 1840s, there's a big campaign to, well, in our terms, to map the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the reason they want to do that is again to improve navigation. The, the, the magnetic field isn't isn't quite constant; it varies in different places. You know, if you can if you can accurately chart those variations, then again that's a good way of finding a way around at sea. And that kind of scientific enterprise is entirely dependent on the admiralty, on on the navy. So it, they're, you know, they're their ships. You know, many of the men of science carrying out the measurements. Are naval officers. Naval officers. Uh, naval officers are trained to carry out those kinds of th- those kinds of measurements. Um, and similarly, you know, later you know, when people go off on expeditions to you know, to observe eclipses or to ex- to observe the transit of Venus, you know, that's facilitated by by, by by the navy. And again, it's not done just out of the goodness of the navy's heart. You know, these things are seen as being potentially useful. And of course, they're also impre- expressions of imperial power you know, carried over. So, you know, we can carry an observatory to wherever and and discipline those places and make them places where where where, where science can be done. And yeah, I mean, as you say, I mean, in things like battleship design during the final decades of the nineteenth century, then yeah, I mean, so, you know, there, you know, there are there, there are small armies of of naval architects, naval engineers. You know, working to you know, to build these huge new dreadnoughts that are going to that are going to dominate the seas at the beginning of the twentieth century, um, and in terms of things like powered flight, you know, that dream of powered flight that you know, that powers much of the Victorian imagination during the nineteenth century. Early pioneers, people like George Cayley, for example, certainly see. You know, the flying machines as you know, as part of the armory of empire, if you like. And it's very, very noticeable. I mean, if you, I mean, if you look at you know, what we would call science fiction, what the Victorians would call scientific romance um, by the end of the 19th century, 
um, speculation about fears surrounding war in the air and the possibilities yeah, yeah. of aerial warfare kind of dominate that kind of fiction. I mean, it's you know, by, you know, by the end of the 19th century, everybody thinks that another war is coming, pretty much. Um, there's some disagreement as to who the protagonists on the different side might be. Um, sometimes it's Britain versus France. Sometimes it's Britain and France versus Germany. Sometimes it's Britain and France versus Russia. But everybody thinks that war is inevitable. And similarly, everybody thinks that in the case of war, if some, if, if one of the great powers gets their hands on flying machines before the rest, then you know, that's it. You know, control of the air would mean domination of Europe, and that kind of plays get, that gets played out in in all kinds of you know, fantastic scientific romances you know, in popular news, in popular magazines in novel forms. And there's actually an intimate connection between you know, technology, warfare, imperial power, and you know, what technology can offer. Actually, Kelly, so you, uh, that was one of the questions that we, we did want to, uh, we did want to raise. And that is that um, you, you mentioned, of course, and you spend a bit of time in the, in the book talking about the conflict uh, between the, 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 the old traditional and the new innovative scientists in the fight for control of the Royal Society. Um, it, given, given that and given the, the, the struggle for um, professionalism, if you will, or proper credentialing, what, how much impact did the, the sort of um, more eccentric or the, the folks who were not necessarily conforming to the new structure of science what kind of an impact did some of these innovative thinkers have? You've argued in a previous work about Tesla, for example, that one of the reasons that Tesla doesn't succeed as, as Edison does is because Tesla consciously was an outsider and consciously wanted to, to depict himself as a, as a solo operator, you know, kind of a giant of technology on his own. So um, we were curious about how that, it, were there similar struggles or similar contributions made by uh, the, the more eccentric and I'm not conforming with the, the, the imperial project um, during this era? Um, I mean, I think in that respect, I mean, the, I mean the, the, the story of powered flight or the efforts of powered flight right. uh, is, is quite revealing. Um, I mean, take someone like George Cayley, you might mm-hmm. just mentioned who is fascinating in lots of ways because he's both an insider and an outsider. Um, I mean, he's a Yorkshire landlord, not really the kind of person you'd imagine as an, as an engineering innovator. Right. But he's fascinated by flying machines, uh, both of the lighter and lighter than air and, and heavier than air varieties. Um, he is a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers. I mean, he's deeply involved in establishing the Royal Polytechnic Institution. So he has his kind of place in the, in the institutional structure of, 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 of Victorian science and invention, if you like. Um, and it's hugely influential. I mean, the Wright brothers look back at Cayley as you know, one of the kind of great innovators of, 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 of flight. Um, but yeah, then you have others. I mean, people like um, William Henson and John John Stringfellow. I mean, this, I mean, this is this is brilliant. Um, one of my favourite images in the in the book, um, if you go and leaf through it and find it, is an image of Stringfellow and Henson's aerial steam carriage flying over flying over the Nile with with, with the pyramids in in the background. Um, it's a fantastic image. It's completely made up, of course. There's no such thing as 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 a, as a flying steam engine. Um, but again, I mean, Stringfellow and Henderson have patented the aerial steam carriage. Um, they've invented a new lighter steam engine that they hope will be light enough to take it up into the sky. Um, they're not coming from nowhere. Um, they both have backgrounds in 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 in, in making lace making machinery. You know, so, you know, so they're mechanics. Yeah, you know, they you know, they know how you know, how how stuff works. 
Um, they patented the thing. Uh, they try and set up a company. And you know, that image, we have that image because one of the things they did you know, to try and advertise and bring, and, you know, and bring in finance um, was produce this series of trade cards you know, showing, the, you know, showing the, the aerial steam carriage flying over various cityscapes and landscapes. I mean, I like the Nile one because you know, there's that kind of evocation of empire and expansion in, in, in that image. Yeah, so all of those things are kind of bound up together. Um, but yeah, I mean, they never make it. The aerial steam carriage, sadly, never never really makes it off the ground. But I mean, there are constant efforts throughout the 19th century by people with various kinds of relationships, shall we say, to 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 side of the institutions yeah, to yeah, to make that dream of flying come come true. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there's an interesting paradox, I think, here in that, I mean, increasingly during the 19th century, you see this myth, and it really is a myth, of the individual innovator you know, becoming more and more established. Um, you know, in 1859, Samuel Smiles publishes, publishes Self-Help, you know, that kind of Bible of the Victorian middle classes, you know, how to, how to improve yourself, how to make yourself better, built around this notion of individualism. You've got to do it by yourself. You know, that's that's the mark of, of masculinity. And you know, inventors are the you know are the, are the heroes of self help in all sorts of ways. So you get this kind of myth of the individual innovator, the individual inventor, who's going to change the world. Of course, at the same time, that's not actually how Victorian science and engineering worked. Not at all. Um, yeah, if we take something like the well, like the Atlantic Cable, again, um, yeah, there is a name associated with the Atlantic Cable. Yeah, this is Cyrus Field's dream. This is Cyrus Field's project. But kind of underneath that kind of individualist gloss, well, actually, there are armies of dozens if not hundreds of engineers electricians all sorts of people working together to make something like that into a into a reality um or take something like that you know you know that kind of iconic image and i'm sure it's going to be familiar to to lots of your listeners of isambard kingdom brunel you know, yes, there we yes. have brunel in his stovetop hat chomping a cigar Standing in front of the of, of the anchor chains of, of the Great Eastern, you know, that's a kind of you know, epitome of the Victorian inventor. That's kind of rugged, individualist, gargantuan. You know, he's going to make things that are bigger than, than anybody's ever made them before. And those are the heroes. But I mean, behind that, of course, again, you know, as with you know, the people who made dreadnoughts at the end of the nineteenth century, you know, these aren't solo projects. <laughs> There are hundreds, there are thousands of people labouring to build these ships. And they're not just labourers, they're just, you know, these are highly skilled, trained people. And it's that that makes invention and innovation possible. Which, again, I think is one of the important messages of the book. When we think about, you know, where we are now, when we think about our own futures now and who's, so to speak, responsible for our futures that was something I noticed um, I was reading late in the book. And it is, a, it is a, a, a point that you do make in your epilogue, which is a very strong one, is how this is a, not just a masculine ideal, but very clearly a particular class and type of man. And that it continues to be bound up in, despite this new vision of the future, that it's very much a technological shift and that that in a sense becomes a substitute for societal change. In other words, in order for these, these amazing technologies and for this new vision of the future to actually occur and come to pass, the technology appears to have to stay bound in, in you know, to a certain extent, the old order of class individual empire and there is no room for clearly no room for women clearly no room for anyone who is not uh english clearly no room for anybody who is not of a particular class or cannot lift themselves by their bootstraps into that particular class 
So um, I'm uh, part of my work is social history. And so I'm fascinated by the amazing technological innovations and this new way of thinking, which still needs to embed itself in the current imperial structure. And that ultimately, I think one of the points, and please correct me if I'm wrong, one of the points you make is that it, it's, it, 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 we need to recognize that and, perha- and shift from that if we're, in fact, going to move forward into an even better future. Um, yes, I mean, I'm glad you got that because that really, <laughs> that really is what I want to, where, I went, where I want to end up with, with, with the book. Um, I mean, yes, I mean, we still think about the future, I think, very much using that kind of rule book that the Victorians invented. And I think it's important that we remember that. Um, and that's what I'm trying to remind people of in, in the book. Yes. Because yeah, embedded in that way of thinking about the future, embedded in that way of doing things, are some old, very often relatively unexamined assumptions about how obviously how self-evidently things should get done and what kind of people should do them that actually we might want to examine a little bit more carefully and think well is this really how we want to do things now around about the end of the 19th century um unsurprisingly um there's a flurry of interest in the year 2000, you know, they're coming up to the year 1900. In another year, and in another century, it's going to be the year 2000. So not just another, just not just the end of another century, but the end of a of another millennium. Um, so there's a lot of speculation about you know, what things will be like in in, in the year 2000. Um, and you get artist impressions, for example, of the year 2000, um, which are full of strange and wonderful machines and technologies um, of all kinds. Uh, There are flying machines. Everything works by electricity. They've invented a thing they call the telectroscope. Uh, Immediately after 1876, when Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone, people start talking about, oh, we'll soon have the telectroscope, which is basically a way of seeing at a distance as well. So rather than going to the opera, you just sit at home and the opera will be projected into your into your in, into your into your into your drawing room. Um, so these wonderful renderings of kind of future tech. But what's very striking when it eventually dawns on you what it is you're looking at is how the people doing things with these new technologies are dressed. You know, this is the year two thousand. They're all dressed like middle-class members of society at the end of the 19th century. In other words, very, very strongly, I think, the message being conveyed, yes, this is the future, and this is a future for people like you. I mean, that's what, that's what that all means. That's, that's what's going on here. So, yes, I mean, these are visions of the future. There are futures for, basically, the white middle classes. And I think that we need to be aware now as we contemplate our own futures that we should remember where these sorts of ways of thinking come from and think about how we might want to adapt our institutions, adapt our ways of thinking about how futures are made and who futures belong to. Um, Not only sort of there are more collective that they're more you know, you know, they're, you know they're better related to you know the lives people now actually live uh live but, but because we can make better futures i think like that as well you know by opening up possibilities that are closed off if we just think well you know future making is basically a game for white middle class men well you know there are other visions out there and life at the very least I think would be more interesting if you know, those alternative visions were were given an opportunity as well. You and there's been really really interesting I wish we could have uh, more time this is this is a subject that I could probably sit here all day and listen to but um, would you mind uh, reminding our listeners uh, the title of your, of your book and where they can get it? 
Um, the book is called How the Victorians Took Us to the Moon. And it is, I hope, available in all good bookshops, in all good bookstores, and in very, very many places online. Uh, it's available as a hardback, it's available on Kindle, and it's available as an audiobook. So Terrific. we'll try and get it on, onto our uh, online bookstore as well, so that when, uh, when, when you buy it, when our listeners buy the book, and you should, because I've read it as well, and it's fantastic, not only will History Hat get a small cut, but you will get a bigger cut than the guys at Amazon <laughs> will only waste it on space rockets anyway. We want a book on how Victorians get to the moon, not how Jeff Bezos gets to the moon. So, uh, <laughs> no, Nina and Ewan, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. This was yeah, a, my pleasure. Indeed a pleasure. Uh, greatly appreciated to be included in co-host today. And thank you so much, Professor. That was a fascinating discussion. And along with Chris, oh my, I have so many other questions, but so I'll be sure to finish the book and uh, and take it from there. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.